just want to learn the storyline of fear. So play this, this video and learn more. I guess. I should. Mm. Mm. I don't know. I think you hear me all right. Yeah, just learn the storyline, see what what's going on and stuff. I guess. So I'm kind of a little confused. I guess a little bit. What happened before the events of Fear? How is Paxton Fettel linked to Alma? And where was Point Man before the events of Fear 3? During the introduction of Fear 3, Point Man is captured and held within a cell. But how did he get there? These are the topics I'll cover for this video, along with some connections to other parts of the story. If you don't know anything about Fear, here's the story so far. Alma Wade was the daughter of a scientist named Harlan Wade. She was born with tremendous psychic powers, and there was no explanation as to how she acquired these gifts. Hmm. Alma's mother passed away during labor, so she never really got to bond with her. Harlan Wade brought his daughter to Armacam Technology Corporation when she was just three years old. She was tested for every type of psychic power. Because of her gifts, she suffered nightmares. Her powers also allowed her to tune into the negative emotions of the people around her. Alma underwent these tests for many years she even failed some of them on purpose, hoping they would stop everything. But it only continued. Harlan Wade was warned about Alma being too dangerous, and eventually, she would have to be sealed away somewhere. Everyone knew this day would come. Harlan Wade barely showed any sign of sympathy for Alma's well-being. He was more focused on the research about her psychic abilities. Her powers were extremely dangerous so she was locked in a vault and placed into a coma. This would then neutralize her psychic abilities from causing harm to others in the facility. She was part of Project Origin, and the purpose of this was to create psychic individuals from a psychic host. She was then impregnated two times on purpose with DNA mixed from Origin researchers and Harlan Wade himself. Since a very young age, Alma was tormented, and she never got to experience growing up in a normal life. The first son was born when Alma was 15 years old. This was Point Man, but his psychic abilities were almost non-existent. He was instead gifted with enhanced reflexes, giving him extremely dangerous combat abilities. The second son was Paxton Fettel, which was only a year later. This subject would have psychic abilities. Paxton Fettel was part of the Project Perseus, its mission was to produce a psychic commander that could issue orders to replica soldiers via telepathy. Alma would merge her consciousness with Paxton Fettel when he was just 10 years old. This was then called the first synchronicity event. This made Paxton Fettel very violent, resulting in the deaths of staff members. Alma's body was then removed from life support, and her body died soon after. But her psychic energy remained inside the vault with her corpse. The facility was then shut down for around 20 years. By the time Fettel was 24 years old, a successful link between himself and replica soldiers was created. He also started having dreams of killing people and cannibalizing them. Armacam tried to find the source of these dreams, but there was nothing linked to Alma, so the reason for these intentions remained a mystery. ATC President Jean-Vierre Aristide reopened the Origin facility, even though ATC scientists told her that Alma's psychic powers were still lingering in the area. A team was sent in to investigate, but they were wiped out by Alma. This reopening caused Paxton Fettel to go through a psychotic breakdown, and he turned homicidal. There was a Dark Horse comic book that goes into detail about the second synchronicity event, Paxton Fettel is seen within a cell of the ATC headquarters. When a voice speaks to him, he responds by saying, Who are you? Why are you in my head? What do you want? The voice explains its motives, 
And Paxton then says, You are me. We are one. Show me your pain. Make me understand. Some guards are seen discussing about Paxton Fettel and the replicas. These soldiers are replicas. Mindless clones. Fettel is their mind. He's a psychic commander who can direct their actions with his thoughts. It's only happened one time before, but when it did, his brain waves changed. It was like someone else had entered his mind. They increased security because the first synchronization event resulted in a few casualties. This scene is later showed after the credits in Fear 3. Paxton Fettel is met by Alma. Shortly after, his mind goes absolutely crazy. As more guards enter the room, their heads begin to explode. It's as if Fettel's powers were amplified somehow, but soon enough, other guards are able to stop him. As we return to the comic book, an image of a little girl is seen on a video camera. One guard assumes it's just interference from a broadcast signal, but they still decide to check it out. Paxton Fettel is seen talking to someone. Both of us. We've both been used. They know where you are. They'll try to stop me from finding you, but they'll have to tell me. I'll see to that. They used us both. They caused you great pain. Show me. Show me, and they will pay. The door to his cell opens, and Alma appears. Her memories would be seen by Paxton Fettel. All the tests, all the torment, all the tears, all the pain, he saw it all. Paxton saw everything Alma had gone through as a child. It was time to make them pay. A guard would be seen patrolling a hallway. He sees nothing. The little girl they saw earlier must have been caused by interference. The last image is of Pax and Fettel exiting his cell. As the guard starts to turn around, Alma appears before him, but she's hanging upside down from the ceiling. The guard starts to feel some type of pain, and his flesh burns away as the scene ends. Paxton is then seen walking through the hallways of ATC headquarters. He approaches a guard monitoring the cameras and kills him instantly. Replica soldiers begin attacking the ATC staff members, shooting everyone they come in contact with. Paxton Fettel would sneak up on one man and ask him, Tell me where you're keeping Alma. The man says he doesn't know who Alma is. Paxton says, Your tongue can lie, but your flesh will tell me everything. The last scene in the comic book shows Paxton Fettel cannibalizing someone's body, and in this process, Here's one thing you need to do before buying anything online. Don't spend another dime on Amazon until you watch this. He's able to gain the person's memories. As it gets up, he says, he deserved to die. They all deserve to die. And the comic book ends here. If you played the first game, you'll know that Point Man eventually meets up with Paxton Fettel and puts a bullet through his head. You also see Alma being released from the vault by Harlan Wade. His body is then also destroyed by Alma. The facility is destroyed in a huge explosion and Alma is set free. But you still survive and are picked up by Holiday and Jin Sun Kwan in a helicopter. The ending shows Alma boarding your helicopter as you make your escape from the area. What happens next depends on which sequel you're reading. There are two expansion packs for the original game. Extraction Point continues right after the first game. Where the helicopter ends up crashing, Point Man, Holiday, and Jin try to escape a city they are in. Perseus Mandate is the other expansion pack, but it does not follow the story right after the first game. It tends to go in a different direction. These two expansions are regarded as taking place in an alternate universe. There was a short digital comic which was part of Fear 2. It was a few scenes of what happened after the helicopter crash in the original Fear game. Jin looks around for Holiday but doesn't see him or Point Man near the crash. Nobody is around. She looks at the ground nearby, and a trail of bloody footprints are leading away from the helicopter. The sound of a person is heard behind Jin. It's the pilot. He might still be alive. She turns to look at him, and he asks, Jin, what happened? Jin responds back move. to him, cool. Bremer, I'm glad to see you made it. But a line of blood drips down his ear. 
Something's not right. Bremer starts screaming from a sudden pain in his head. It gets stronger and stronger until the flesh on his face explodes. Bremer is gone. As his corpse falls down, Alma is seen in front of the helicopter. She followed them after the explosion of the facility. The camera zooms in and the screen fades to black. This is one scenario of what happened after the ending of the first game. During the demo of Fear 2, Paxton Fettel can be heard talking about Alma. This dialogue was later removed from the full version of the game, but here's what he says. Miss Alma. She was 8 years old the last time she stood in sunlight. In her life, she has known nothing but pain. It is the way of men to make monsters. It is the nature of monsters to destroy their makers. Alma had children at a very young age. Despite all the pain, suffering, loneliness, and isolation she went through, her two children were something she wanted to hold on to. But when they were taken away from her, her angry spirit would not rest. This is why Alma is seen as a vengeful ghost. In the story of Fear 2, Michael Beckett showed signs of psychic powers at a young age, but ATC wiped his memory of the experiment so he does not remember any of this. He was later seen to excel in military combat. He underwent a surgical procedure that would attune his psychic signal to match Alma Wade's. Beckett was then used as bait. This is why Alma would chase him throughout the campaign of Fear 2. In the end, she became pregnant with Michael Beckett's child and escaped. So now let's talk about Fear 2's DLC. It was simply called Reborn. The intro shows Paxton Fettel in a cell. With some dialogue, he says this. The war has begun. Just as I dreamed it would. Just as I foresaw. Dreams are all I have now. Dreams of death, of blood and fire, of her. The time has come to awaken, to be reborn. You are the key. Foxtrot813 is the main character of interest. It appears to be another replica soldier. It lands in the city and immediately comes in contact with ATC forces. You would meet up with the rest of your squad but would start to have hallucinations. Oh, yeah, the rest of your squad group, appears to look like now, yeah. ghostly images or some unknown assailants. As you fight against them, Foxtrot813 would gain the slow-mo ability. He would lose contact with Command Leader and the other replica soldiers. An image of Paxton Fettel would appear in a flash. He would speak out to you, saying these words. Do you see? You are different from the others. They are meaningless now. They are ghosts. You must set me free. When your hallucination ends, you realize that the ghosts you attacked were other replica soldiers part of your squad, so now you are marked for termination. As you make your escape, Paxton Fettel would appear to you in various places, as if he was guiding you or controlling you to go somewhere. When you free Paxton Fettel, you stand before him as he wants to look upon you. He has dreamed of this moment and calls you his brother. The ghostly image of Paxton Fettel starts to fade away and it is believed that his ghost has now acquired a new body that looks just like his original self. He is now reborn. A possible theory as to why Foxtrot813 looked like Paxton Fettel could have been linked from Perseus' mandate the ending shows the Nightcrawlers were able to get a sample of the DNA that belonged to Paxton Fettel. Perhaps they cloned him at some point in time. But since the expansion packs for the original game take place in either a different universe or a different timeline, it's really hard to connect this to Fear 2 or Fear 2 Reborn. Or maybe he was cloned from a young age when Harlan Wade noticed that Fettel had psychic abilities and throughout all this time, it could have been kept a secret. You see, there's no clear answer, but these are just two theories of mine. It's I also hard to say if this cool. new body ties into Fear 3 at all, or if this is just a standalone story. And this brings us to the introduction of Fear 3. Point Man is being held captive in a cell somewhere. 
He's being asked about Jin Sun Quan, but he does not respond. The game did not say how he ended up here, but there was a prequel comic book that does explain this. It takes place right after the ending of the first game. After he escaped with Holiday and Jin, Alma appears on the chopper, she kills the pilot, and they crash. This comic book prequel connects the first and third game together. After the helicopter crashes, we do get a glimpse of Point Man, but his mask is damaged, so he takes it off from here. He searches the burning helicopter for any survivors, but there's nobody left to help. Since Jin appears later in Fear 3, you can assume she left the crash site early on, but Point Man is then attacked by someone. His body goes flying until it slams into a nearby car. A voice speaks out to him saying this, Time to wake up. This voice sounds familiar. Could it be? It is him. It's Paxton Fettel. He warns Point Man, they're coming for you. You'd better run. But Point Man ignores him and fires his weapon upon Fettel. But the bullets seem to have no effect. So he decides to run off and see what he should do next. Meanwhile, Fettel simply taunts him in the distance. Yes, that's it. Run. You can run, but you can't hide. Point Man turns down an alley and keeps on running. What do you know about the a comics? trail of bloody footprints can be seen. This could be a sign that Alma is nearby. Up ahead, you see a few enemy comics. soldiers yeah, confronting Point Man, but his quick reflexes gives him the upper hand. He dodges them and returns fire, taking the small group down. Fatal looks at what Point Man did to the group of men he encountered and says, Bravo. You are still mother's little killing machine, aren't you? Point Man looks back, but gives no response. Point Man continues to run some yeah, more. He, doesn't talk. he needs to escape this area. Somebody is looking for him. But to make matters worse, a fiery pit forms in front of him, stopping him in his tracks. It is Alma. No matter where he runs, Alma will always find him. The three of them are joined together. Not the best timing, but it's something Fettel seems to look forward to. He says this, Quite a reunion. We are drawn together. Do you know why? Point Man doesn't want any can, part of this and just runs pain. off again. Fettel tells him, forever. You can't run forever. So it comes but this time, time it turns out that running only led him to a dead end. He's then surrounded by armored camp military forces. It seems like there's no way out this time. Amongst the enemies, we can see a phase commander, which makes an appearance in Fear 3 later on. Yep. He simply says to Point Man, End of the line, lab rat. One of the soldiers hits Point Man with the butt of the rifle and knocks him out. His body is taken away by the phase commander. Fettel's last words to Point Man are this, Next time, maybe you'll listen to your brother. And this connects to the opening of Fear 3 where we see Point Man tied up and held captive, as ATC guards are asking him for the location of Jin Sun Quan. And this brings us to the end of the video. This explains what happened before the events of Fear, what happened after Fear, and where was Point Man before Fear 3. And as for the story in Fear 3, during Point Man's ending, for some reason he's now able to damage Fettel's ghost, maybe it has something to do with physical contact, but I don't damage Fettel's ghost. In Point Man's ending, for some reason, he's not able to damage Fettel's ghost. Maybe it has something to do with physical contact, but I don't know. After a few shots into the head, Fettel's ghost fades and burns away. Alma dies giving birth to her new child, and Point Man carries it with them, as Alma's body burns away. And in Fettel's ending, he takes control of Point Man's body and takes the child, planning to have it serve him later on. But his last act is consuming Alma's body, maybe to make him more unstoppable. Perhaps he gained her powers in the process, but it's a pretty gruesome ending. So that covers some lore within the Fear franchise. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like on it, and to see more lore videos oh, over different franchises, that, so. just subscribe to my channel. This. Thanks for watching, I this is Acid comics, Glow, and I'll see you yeah, in the next the video. Comics. Still don't know the extent of the damage. We haven't been able to get through to anyone since the explosion. What about Alma? What happened to her? What was that sound?
next I'm gonna watch that one up. Story of Fear 3. They're coming straight in. Trust me, I've got We were brothers. Prototype commanders in the emerging field of psychic warfare. I was the favorite. Okay. I gave them what they wanted. Video I gave them blood. They say the synchronicity with my mother made me. Oh, I find the views. I'll click that real quick. Oh. Oh, 3K. We were, I gave them what they wanted. I gave them blood. They say the synchronicity with my mother made me homicidal. He was the first prototype. His enhanced reflexes made him an unstoppable killer. When my brother found me, he put a bullet in my head. But our psychic link never broke. Like a curse, bound by blood. I saw Armacan retro. Oh, okay. So, okay, so he's just kind of letting the game do the explaining. I get it. Switch to Chrome to load your favorite sites fast, so you can browse with ease. Forever, the themes of which games were mandated by their respective producers. Lead designer on Shogo and Nolf, Craig Hubbard, and his team were given an opportunity to make a game that they wanted to with fear. Both Shogo and Nolf's universes could be described as rather out there at times, so Fear was a conscious effort to make a more grounded property, starting out as something akin to Ghost in the Shell. As time went on, the concept took a more militaristic turn, but not too drastic a turn, as a conversation that Craig Hubbard had with a friend who worked at Valve prompted him to limit military aspects of the game 
due to it being obvious that he was sort of just making things up. It wasn't until the technical side of development presented itself that the idea for supernatural horror came into the picture. Hubbard and the development team were working with new technology at the time, that being the Lithtech Jupiter EX, an extended version of Monolith was impregnated, and at 15, she gave birth to the first prototype, who was and restraints due to potential performance issues, the horror aspect of fear finally came into existence. Inspired heavily by Japanese horror, a topic we'll expand on later, Hubbard and his team crafted huh? what we now know as a staple that was that game of I remember they said something about that. I was looking for that. Oh yeah, I see the girl with the red dress. I have to watch that. <laughs> I actually might have to watch that. Here, Hubbard and his team crafted what we now know as a staple on the franchise. However, in terms of naming, they didn't want to make it so that fear was obviously horror. Rather, an action game with an unexpected twist. A name for the game they'd created that they had floating around the office was Signal, but Monolith's publisher on Fear at the time, Vivenda Universal, decided that the title of the game must be trademarkable, and that's how the acronym Fear was born. You will be a god among men. To refresh ourselves with events and personalities in this universe, let's quickly go over the lore of Fear. By the way, we'll be using the Monolith timeline here. Our story begins in 1973, when NASA asks Armacam Technology Corporation, one of the world's leading technology firms, to conduct studies on microgravity-related health problems in correlation to their astronauts. The mission is dubbed Project Icarus. Armacam is involved with the military, and around the same time, they're developing a method to hasten communications between command and soldiers in the Vietnam War. Through the use of a powerful psychic, reports and commands could be communicated telepathically without the need for heavy and slow equipment. The program is started by a man named Harlan Wade, and its primary test subject is his seven-year-old daughter, Alma, who is an extremely powerful psychic. Alma's abilities never gave her a chance at a normal life, as she absorbs and feeds off negative thoughts from other people, which constantly gave her nightmares. The testing done on her to see just how competent a psychic she really was were done to her at the age of three and were often painful. At the age of five, she became violent, giving Armacam employees vivid nightmares and even starting fires within laboratories. Two days before her 8th birthday, she was put in an induced coma and locked away in a vault. After deciding that Alma was too unstable for their needs, Harlan yeah, and his birthday? team chose to instead see if Alma's psychic traits could be passed down to a child. At the age of 14, with Harlan and his team's DNA, Alma was impregnated, and at 15, she gave birth to the first prototype, who was ultimately deemed a failure. This is who later becomes the Point Man. Harlan tried again, this time using a different set of DNA, and at 16, Alma gave birth to a second prototype, who they named Paxton Fettel. Ten years after this, Alma managed to synchronize her mind with Fettel's in what was referred to as the first synchronicity event. Fettel killed many ATC soldiers before being tranquilized. By that point, Alma was deemed far too dangerous to be left alive, so Armacam cut her life support and left her to die in the vault, which was later sealed. In those 10 years, Armacam cancelled Project Icarus in favor of something named Project Perseus, 
which centered around Pat Kinfettle and his ability to telepathically link himself to clone soldiers that he could command. The test subjects from Project Icarus were locked away. Skip about 30 years into the future and the current president of Armacam, Genevieve Aristide, wants to reopen the Project Origin facility to repurpose it against the wishes of Harlan Wade. Aristide sent a squad of soldiers into the facility, but they're never heard from again. Everything culminates when Alma, whose psychic presence seeped out of the facility when it was opened, finds Fettel and synchronizes her mind with him again in what's called the second synchronicity event. Fettel takes control of a battalion of clone soldiers named the Replicas and begins his search for his mother. A special forces team going under the name of First Encounter Assault Recon, led by Armacam's first prototype, Point Man, was sent in to stop Fettel and put an end to the slaughter. Unbeknownst to many, Project Perseus was not the only movement to produce psychic commanders by Armacam. When Project Origin was abandoned, Armacam tweaked the concept of creating said commanders by using already existing test subjects instead of breeding them, and this was named Project Paragon. Under the guise of a school, children would be given ESP testing and exposed to chemical compounds to see who had the capacity for psychic abilities. Those with potential were moved into another army camp study called Project Harbinger. Most notable subjects of that project would be Michael Beckett, Red Jankowski, James Fox, Harold Keegan, and Cedric Griffin. Other notable characters in this universe would include Alice Wade, Spencer Jankowski, Jim Sun Kwan, Douglas Holliday, Richard Vanek, Terry Halford, Rodney Betters, and Kira Stokes. Now, with all this out of the way, let's finally get into some action. When Fear came out in 2005, most people couldn't praise its action enough. The quality of Fear's gunplay can be attributed to many things. First off, the influence. Craig Hubbard, the lead designer, was a big fan of Hong Kong action films. Fear's primary action influence seems to come from John Woo movies. John Woo frequently used dual pistols, slow motion, and objects flying around to great effect, and that can all be seen in Fear. The Jupiter EX engine gave us dynamic and real-time particle effects and lighting which means that everything feels like a real experience and not just scripted sequences, so it's almost like playing a John Woo movie at times. Sound also played a big part in why Fear's action felt just right. You can hear your shell casings hitting the floor. You can hear the burst of air that shoots out of the HD penetrator every time you fire it. And you can hear bullets sinking into Kevlar or armor when you fire them into someone. The grenade triggers and explosions are distinct, but all offer a large, satisfying boom. And when paired in a room with windows, you can hear them bursting due to pressure. This, in tandem with the real-time visuals and the engine's ability to create solidity and impact, ensures that there's no two same fights in the game. You can replay the same part three times and get a different experience out of it. The game also features different enemy types. You have your standard replicas and armor camp troops, but in addition, you also have heavy armor replicas, nightmares, power armor, and assassins. There's certainly something to be said about the combination of variety within the game. When you combine elements of real life and blend them into a virtual space like this while adding in different elements, it helps immersion and investment in a game. And that's partly why I think Fear's action side is so highly regarded. There's also the issue of very smart enemies, but we'll get to that in a little while. <laughs> Fear would not be fear without Alma Wade. In every game, she demands the player's attention, sometimes in not so great ways, but her presence guarantees that the game will keep you on your toes. Alma's origins from a creative standpoint are quite interesting, and not what you may think. Most assume that Alma is a clone of Sadako or Samara from The Ring, and while inspiration from those works is certainly there, the sources come straight from literature. 
Alma got her name from the 1979 Peter Straub novel, Ghost Story, in where a group of men accidentally kill a woman and leave her in a watery grave, who then reappears as a ghost many decades later under the the name Alma Mowgli. It should be noted that Ghost Story was adapted into a film in 1981 where Alma is played by Alice Krieg. Alma's sister in fear is also named Alice, but it's noted that Ghost Story was adapted into a film in 1981 where Alma is played by Alice Krieg. Alma's sister in fear is also named Alice, which is likely a nod to the movie. Alma's physical appearance is derived from Japanese horror films, which the lead designer Craig Hubbard was a large fan of. Specifically, Alma is closest to the little girl in 2001's Seance, which is an adaptation of the novel Seance on a Wet Afternoon by Mark McShane. Seance director Kiyoshi Kurosawa's unique use of audio in his horror films also seems to have inspired the sound design in Fear, with instead of just music, there's ambient tracks and jarring sound effects. Fear's horror is highly psychological, and takes cues from the films it's inspired from. You'll see Alma for a split second and then she'll disappear, leaving you to wonder if you really saw anything at all. Fear doesn't place you in a position to actually see Alma in all her creepy glory until the end of the game just as Ringu only lets you see hints of Sadako until Takayama encounters her at the end of the film. Usually preceding an Alma encounter is complete silence and then sharp sound effects, like this brilliant scene in Kiyoshi Kurosawa's Pulse. <laughs> the the horror in fear works simply because the player <laughs> usually isn't expecting it. Sure, it may not be scary the second time around, but that first time when you were going from point A to point B and then almost spooked you, likely scared the hell out of you. Fear preys on the mind, with Alma sometimes appearing in monitors and not in your immediate vicinity. The game also only explains what and who she is in pieces, so you don't necessarily understand what's going on with her appearances for a while. Beyond Alma, the game's atmosphere feeds the horror because it's so desolate and silent, and just bumping into a shelf can create large noises which keep you on edge. What helps break up horror parts is act- If it's Hillshire Farm, oh hell yeah and there wouldn't be any action in this game without... I think it's fair to say that Fear's action wouldn't be so highly regarded if the AI wasn't so amazing. Many attribute just the artificial intelligence in Fear to how interesting it was to engage enemies, and with good reason too, as they act almost human and move around as you'd expect an actual squad of soldiers to, but it goes beyond just the AI. Fear's AI was developed by a man named Jeff Orkin and uses an architecture he developed named Goal Oriented Action Planning, GOAT for short, meaning that AI will choose behaviors that will satisfy its current goals at the moment. Goals are conditions that the agents in the game want to satisfy. Sometimes that's hiding behind cover and sometimes that's shooting at you both of which likely fall under the category of aggressive goals. As written in Jeff Orkin's 11-page paper explaining how GOAP works, AI that can formulate its own plan to satisfy a certain goal will result in less repetitive behavior and can adapt their actions to fit their current situation. 
However, with less repetitive AI comes more repetitive levels, as anything that could confuse the AI in the levels was taken out, resulting in many of Fear's environments being extremely empty. Now, this is all on the technical side, so how does the player appreciate all of this without knowing the internals of the game? Well, that's with communication. The enemies in the game communicate with each other very well. They tell their squads what to do, what you're doing, and what actions they're going to take against you, such as... And... Their speech goes beyond just actions, as they also ask questions and speak about things happening within the plot. It's a combination of speech, level design, and the architecture that lets the AI react accordingly to situations that gives Fear's combat that aggressive, lifelike kick. Fear was released in October of 2005 and became Monolith's best-selling title yet. It was given a 9 out of 10 by Eurogamer, a 9.1 by GameSpot, and a 9.2 by IGN. It attracted the attention of legendary filmmaker John Carpenter, who in an interview with GameSpot praised the game highly and said he'd love to be a spokesperson for it. Carpenter is important, but we'll get back to him later. For other promotional considerations, there was a series of live-action vignettes shot for the game that centered around Alma. These were directed by Steven Redmond. These were included in another release of Fear, which also featured a making of documentary, a developer's commentary, and machinima called Panics by Rooster Teeth. Jeff Orkin, who created Fear's AI, wrote an article based solely on the AI in the game, which he presented at GDC in 2006 called Three States and a Plan, the AI of Fear. Fear's SDK also saw a release under the name Fear Public Tools, where you could use the tools that were used to create the game and navigate through all the game's assets. Although by October of 2005, Monolith was owned by Warner Brothers, Fear was published by Vivendi Universal. Vivendi also published the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 ports of the game, which were developed by Day One Studios. With Fear released and a big success, but Monolith being owned by Warner Brothers, it's at this time that problems start arising. You killed me. I didn't like that. Vivendi Universal planned two expansion packs for Fear, those being Extraction Point and Perseus Mandate. However, Vivendi and Monolith had a falling out, which caused Vivendi to drop Monolith as the developers and choose Timegate Studios instead. This is where the second Fear timeline begins. First we had the Monolith timeline, but these two expansions belong in what's known as the Vivendi timeline. Extraction Point was released in October of 2006 and features the Point Man again as he, Gein, and Holiday try to make it to an extraction point outside of the city. Paxton Federal and Alma also appear in this expansion, as do the Replica Soldiers. Extraction Point's atmosphere is darker than the original game. There's also more gratuitous scares here, with Alma appearing straight in your face at points. Additions to gameplay include three new weapons, the ability to bash doors open, and breaking open crates for supplies. Extraction Point was met with positive reviews, although many thought that the story was lacking and repetition was an issue. Perseus Mandate was released in November of 2007. Here's where the story starts taking a significant turn. Perseus Mandate features a second fear team, still headed by Rodney Betters. You play as a character that we can only refer to as the Sergeant who also has slow motion abilities like Point Man. Unlike Extraction Point, which takes place after Fear, Perseus Mandate takes place during the events of the first game. Your team is deployed to a secondary Armacam facility to investigate what Armacam has really been doing. Once there, you encounter a third enemy faction called the Nightcrawlers, who are trying to acquire a sample of Paxton Fettel's DNA. 
kill everyone in the building. Percy's Mandate features a lot of new content. There's three additional new weapons on top of what was seen in Extraction Point. There's new ghost enemies. But what's most interesting is the new soldier enemies, the Nightcrawlers. The light and heavy Nightcrawlers are just like the replica, with different weapons. But the Nightcrawler elites are badass. They have the same slow motion powers that you do, making it difficult to hit them. And they can also scale walls and quickly leap off of them. They pose the biggest threat in the game and manage to spice up the gameplay quite a bit. Perseus Mandate was met with slightly above average reviews, with many citing that the game looked dated and it was quite repetitive. Many think that Perseus Mandate was Vivendi's last foray into the Fear franchise, but all the opposite. They were getting ready for something big. Stay out of my way. Not content with Vivendi getting other people to do the Fear expansions, Monolith decided that it would also push on with the franchise as it owned the rights to the characters and universe. Monolith got two teams together, one of them being Craig Hubbard and the folks who worked on Fear to do a PC-exclusive Fear 2, and they got another team of developers from their studio to work on a Fear standalone game for consoles. Vivendi wasn't giving up on the franchise either, as they still owned the name, and reports surfaced that they were also working on a Fear 2, but it'd be in a totally new universe. So we have Vivendi allegedly working on Fear 2, and Monolith definitely working on Fear 2, and another title in the series. But Monolith couldn't technically call their games Fear anymore, so someone had to come up with a new name. During the development of Monolith's new Fear titles, there was apparently another game they were developing. Craig Hubbard and his team. Wait, there so was a Vivendi? Dirt game. game I didn't know about that. New universe. Definitely have Vivendi. I need to look that up. Oh, there, there's two Fear 2s? allegedly working on Fear 2, and Monolith definitely working couldn't technically call their game. During the development of Monolith's new Fear titles, there was apparently another game they were developing. Craig Hubbard and his team were asked to work on that, thus dropping the PC-exclusive Fear 2. The Fear 2 we know today was derived from the standalone Fear title that was being worked on for consoles. But, as I mentioned, Monolith couldn't really call their game Fear anymore, so they had to find a new name for their sequel. In June of 2007, Monolith launched the Name Your Fear contest, where fans could submit names for the new game, and the best one would be picked by Monolith to be the new title of the game. Many hilarious titles like Sausage and Scare were submitted, but in August of 2007, three finalists were announced. Those being Dead Echo, Dark Signal, and Project Origin. Project Origin was chosen as the new name, and trailers were released all throughout 2008. Chosen as the new name, and trailers... Trailers what is this? were released all throughout 2008. This may have been all for naught, however, because in July of 2008, Vivendi merged with Activision and dropped. Right. That trailer looked awesome. I actually, I actually wanted to see that. I want, I want to play that one. They released it.
all of their ongoing games, including the Fear 2 they were working on. By the way, don't forget Vivendi's version of Fear 2, because it's actually quite important. After Vivendi dropped their game projects, Warner Brothers went to work and ended up acquiring the Fear name, and in August of 2008, it was revealed that Project Origin was now Fear 2 Project Origin. Monolith decided to keep the subtitle in, likely due to it being pitched by the fans. According to a few accounts, the development of Fear 2 was turbulent, and in its last year of development, many Monolith employees joined the project to help get it shipped. This included Craig Hubbard and his team that worked on Fear 1. Finally, after losing and regaining its name, and a few years of development, Fear 2 Project Origin was released in February of 2009. Fear 2 continues the story of Alma Wade, ignoring both of Vivendi's expansions. Dave Matthews, primary art lead on Fear 2, had this to say about the expansions in an interview with CBG. TimeGate Studios took the story in a direction that we didn't intend. We look at Extraction Point and Perseus Mandate as an alternate universe, a what could have been. And because of that, it doesn't necessarily diminish the story that we were trying to tell. Fear was about Alma, Fear 2 is about Alma, and we wanted to continue the story the way we originally intended. Fear 2 features a new protagonist named Michael Beckett, who's part of a Delta Force assigned to retrieve Genevieve Aristide and get her into protective custody. The game begins about 30 minutes hmm, before Fear 1 ends. I want to see the what their version is going to be. That was pretty Beckett cool. And the their version of Fear squad are experimented with different. and become beacons that Alma starts coming after. An Armacam cleanup squad is also introduced into the game, headed by Colonel Richard Vanek, in order to silence Aristide and erase all evidence of Project Origin's existence. Get the fucking door open now! That's what I need! Somebody kill this son of a bitch! The replica also make an appearance as they're reactivated after the event of the first game. None of the Fear team makes an appearance in this game, with the focus being given to Dark Signal, the squad that Michael Beckett is a part of. Fear 2 runs on a modified and updated version of the Lithtech Jupiter EX meaning that different approaches were taken in terms of the game's graphical fidelity while retaining the first game's general aesthetic. The game has options for motion blur, film grain, and HDR in order to simulate a more cinematic experience. But don't worry, the game still runs at 60 frames per second and above. Fear 2 features voice work by Alessia Glidewell, John Patrick Lowry, Phil Lamar, Jen Taylor, and more. The game's score was done by Nathan Grigg, who also did the score for the first game. Yeah, well, they one hell of a one heck of a job on this video. Into the music Getting everybody in there and everything. Scenes. The Got only track out. with long vocals in the first cool. game was the intro song, and that was only a placeholder which later turned into the intro because the devs thought it fit so well. In Fear 2, there's many tracks with long vocals that give the atmosphere an enhanced sense of tension as you battle against the enemies. The tracks in this game are comfortably familiar to the songs in the first game, but have twists and layers that give them a bit of depth. Fear 2 features many of the same combat mechanics from the first game, and a lot of new ones as well. Fear 2 uses aim down sights instead of hip fire, adding an entirely new dynamic to the game. Returning from fear is slow motion, an essential element in the gameplay. You get all new weapons in this game, many of which are new takes on older weapons. Some of these weapons also have different fire modes, meaning that you can switch from burst fire to single shot depending on the circumstances of the battle. In addition to the replica and armacam forces, there's now creatures called abominations that you have to fight. They crawl on walls and are quite quick. There's also these things called remnants, which reanimate dead enemies that you have to kill over and over again. 
Fear 2 replaces Fear's lean feature with a cover system, where you can topple over vending machines and other objects to take cover from enemy fire, although this is mostly useful in levels with interior architecture. Many of Fear 2's levels take place outside, in a completely ruined city, adding a nice variety to the mix. And hey, you ever wonder what it would have been like to get into one of the mechs from the first game? Fear 2 says screw that, and lets you drive an even bigger mech while you rampage through the city, destroying all enemy forces, including smaller mechs. Even with all this, Fear 2 also adds in turret sections. While not as John Woo-esque as the combat in the first game, Fear 2's combat packs a punch with a different take on- This game, you're not ready for- on weaponry, enemies, and level design. Combat isn't the only thing Fear 2 does differently from the first game though, and that's quite apparent when you take a look at Alma. Do you see? Alma, who has now been dubbed Mother of the Apocalypse, has three forms in Fear 2. The Child, the Hag, and the new Hot Alma. In the first game, most Hot of Alma's Alma. appearances were contained to her child form, but in this new game, Alma comes at you in full force with all three forms, which gives the horror in the game a totally new depth. Shit, look at Still in the game is the now you see me, now you don't scares, and having hallucinations of different places, but now they're accompanied with Alma being physically aggressive, for reasons which are explained in the plot. Alma's appearances now have different sound design, with large distortions that make it sound like the dimension is ripping every time she appears. I think many would agree with me when I say that the horror in this game is best showcased during the elementary school level. I could describe what I think the best part of this level is, but I'll let you experience it in full. Huh? Don't you see? It should be noted that this level works with more than just horror. Perhaps the best designed and best balanced level, it also works well with the combat. The architecture of a school lends itself to this quite amazingly. See, the horror takes place in contained areas, such as corridors and classrooms, but the action takes place in cafeterias, assembly halls, and recess areas. While exploring the level, you never feel like anything is out of place, because it really isn't. It's a school, and it comes off as totally genuine. Also, some interesting tidbits about this level would include all of the Easter eggs. For example, the sign at the beginning of the level has four letters on the bottom that spell out Alma. On these chalkboards in the music or letters on the bottom that spell out Alma. On these chalkboards in the music room, the notes for Alma's music box theme can be seen. In the classrooms, you can find a board with all the developers' names on it. Yeah, I wish I seen that part. Center. Yeah, 
In a classroom, there's a child drawing of the final confrontation between Paxton Fettel and Point Man from the first game. And finally, there's multiple rugs on the floor in classrooms that present the alphabet with words for each letter. The letter M stands for monolith. Shit, back at CENTCOM, I thought you said his name was Bucket. You know, as in about to kick the... Fear 2 was the subject of a big marketing push that spanned several conventions and stores. Press kits were also given out with artifacts and items from the game. If you pre-ordered Fear 2 at GameStop, you'd get the Armacam Field Guide, a guide detailing the characters and events in the universe. Although Monolith's new release wasn't met with as much love as the first from Eurogamer, who gave Fear 2 a 5 out of 10, it was given a 7 out of 10 by GameSpot and an 8 out of 10 by IGN. Fear 2 was also given a limited edition release in Europe, which included the first Fear and artwork from the game. Multiplayer DLC was released in April of 2009, but it wasn't until August that we saw a character from the past return to the franchise. <laughs> Fear 2 Reborn is the only single-player DLC for Fear 2. Instead of playing as a good guy, Reborn finally lets you play as a replica soldier, Foxtrot 813 to be exact. The story begins with Foxtrot 813 being dropped into combat in a power armor unit as reinforcements for the replica soldiers in their fights against the armor cam troops and the members of Dark Signal. Once Foxtrot has met up with his squad, he begins having hallucinations, with Paxton Vettel appearing in them, telling 813 to set him free. 813 goes rogue, kills his squad, and then sets off on a mission to find Paxton Vettel and free him. Alma also makes appearances in this campaign as she tries to stop you from reaching Vettel. Reborn doesn't offer much new on the combat side of things, but it presents new and unique environments, most notably the knocked over skyscraper that you have to go through. It also has many other visual design elements that work well with this new atmosphere. Reborn was met with average to above average reviews, citing repetition and length as the game's shortcomings. Reborn was also developed by Monolith, in what would be their final entry in the series. It's true, what Mother always said. Sometime in 2008, before development on Fear 2 had finished, Warner Brothers began talks with Day One Studios to make the next game in the franchise, Fear 3, into something even bigger for the series. Day One Studios had met Monolith and Warner Brothers during their development of the Fear port to PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Fear 3 began development some time before Fear 2 was finished, and the story was also likely laid out then as well. You remember that Fear 2 game from Vivendi that never happened? Well, according to Craig Hubbard, because Warner Brothers ended up owning the franchise, that game was officially rebooted as a sequel. Because Fear 3 was in development long before most people even knew about it, it was officially announced in April of 2010. Details revealed that the game was being developed by Day One Studios entirely, although Monolith did aid them in the beginning. It was also revealed that John Carpenter, a longtime fan of the series, and Steve Niles were working on the story. After two delays, Fear 3 was released in June of 2011. Mother's expecting again. Fear 3 takes place nine months after Fear 2 ends. Alma is now nine months pregnant and about to have her third child. Point Man returns as the protagonist, teaming with his brother Fettel, who is now possessing Foxtrot 813's body from Fear 2 Reborn. Throughout the story, they have to find Jean Sun Quan from the first game, and also Michael That's Beckett probably from so the different. second. All the while, Harlan Wade returns and is the main antagonist of the game, and the origins of Point Man and Federal are explored, along with the backstory behind Alma finding them. 
unlike its predecessors that ran on the Tech Jupiter EX, Fear 3 runs on a heavily modified version of the Despair engine and utilizes DirectX 11. The soundtrack was done by Jason Graves and features voice work from a returning Peter Lurie, who has voiced Fettel in all the games, and also Alessia Glidewell. Fear 3's main draw is its gameplay, so let's talk about it. I know it doesn't make sense. Not much does anymore. Fear 3 you takes a me. completely different I approach to horror that. and combat than the two games that came before it. Alma and the previous tactics made for scaring the player are still there, although there's also more scripted events which give the feeling of a spook house. Harlan is the main antagonist, so he shows himself throughout the game in sequences where he'll grab you like Alma does in the second game. The store level in the game is broken down like the elementary school level in Fear 2. Closed corridors like bathrooms and meat rooms are for horror, and open environments like gardening sections are used for combat. Fear 3 also attempts to create atmosphere, with your vision fading in and out, unknowing if anything will appear at all. Fear 3's combat introduces co-op, where the story can be played either with Point Man or Fettel, both of which have different abilities that complement the other. Point Man has the tried and true slow motion, and Fettel has energy attacks, and he can suspend enemies to be shot by Point Man in the air. Gunplay-wise, Fear 3 has an entirely new array of weapons, which are influenced by the weapons from the first game. Different grenade types, melee attacks, and mechs reappear in the game, but making its first appearance is the advanced cover system, where you can snap to cover almost anywhere. On top of his offensive supernatural powers, Fettel can also possess people and fight alongside you with guns. The addition of Fettel into the game really does add a new layer of depth to the gameplay of the franchise, especially when there's all sorts of new enemies. And he's like telepathic. In this game. I feel he's able to like because go through walls. Because the soldiers so aren't in the game as much, Armacam forces are used much more than in any game thus far. You have your standard soldiers, but now you also have the phase casters, who can teleport enemies into a battlefield and who can teleport themselves. There's cultists in the game who run at you and attack you with melee attacks. Some of them can throw knives at you and others have bombs strapped to their chest that explode. Fear 3 has a large multiplayer focus with various modes like Fucking Run and Soul King, the former where you play with friends as you outrun the wall of death before being swallowed up, and the latter is where you play as a ghost and pick up that one. Each fun. kill. All of these can be played with friends or by yourself with bots. Fear 3 was met with positive scores upon release. An 8 out of 10 from Eurogamer, a 7.5 out of 10 from GameSpot, and an 8 out of 10 from IGN. If you pre-ordered the game from GameStop, you'd get a weapon called the Hammer, which belongs to Paxton Vettel. If you pre-ordered from Best Buy, you'd get a weapon called the Shredder. And if you pre-ordered from Amazon, you'd get a Fear 3 comic book. Fear 3 also had many live-action trailers released promoting the game, all directed by Marcus Nispel. Despite positive reviews, after Fear 3 was released, everything about the franchise just went silent. Popular website among fans of the franchise, whatisfear.com, was taken down sometime in 2012, as Warner Brothers cut support for it and neither Monolith nor Day One were reported to be working on anything related to the franchise either. Little did many people know that the final game in the franchise was already in development. You can't have me. In 2010, Korean developer InPlay Interactive said that they had reached an agreement with Warner Brothers to develop a new online fear title by the name of Fear Origin Online for the Korean and Chinese markets. About a year and a half later, they had something to show for it.
Is this only on like PC or something? Korean and Chinese markets. About a year and a half later, they had something to show for it, and it was revealed that the game would have competitive multiplayer modes and a storyline mode. It ran on the Jupiter EX and used all the assets from Fear 2, along with some new ones made by InPlay. Fear Origin Online was released in 2013 and was licensed by Area Games to be released. in America. It was rebranded a bit, and in October of 2014, Fear Online was released on Steam. Fear Online featured four-player co-op through a storyline mode and multiplayer modes like Deathmatch. It also had a crafting system and a currency system which was tied into microtransactions. It followed the storyline of Fear 2, making it another addition into the story element of the franchise, although whether or not anything here is canon to the monolith timeline is unknown. Fear Online didn't last long, and it was officially shut down on May 13th of this year. It was also pulled from Korea not many weeks later. And with that, there's finally complete radio silence on the franchise. After being pulled from Korea and North America, there hasn't really been a whisper on the future of the series. Likely, because there isn't one. I always gauge the legacy of something by asking a simple question. Where would we be if this didn't exist? In the case of Fear, there's an interesting answer. Beyond pushing graphics boundaries with the Jupiter EX and making Monolith a much bigger name, likely the biggest impact the franchise had on this industry was its development in artificial intelligence. Without fear, Jeff Orkin may not have developed the GOAT architecture in 2004 that powered Fear's AI, which later went on to be used in Condemned 1 and 2, Empire Total War, Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, Fallout 3, Deus Ex Human Revolution, Tomb Raider, and Shadow of Mordor. A legacy can also be described as what something meant to people, and fear was well liked by many. Some people think the franchise became you made Fallout. Maybe there's some like the graphics, I guess, more misguided, and I'm not sure I disagree, but I think it helps to look at each game as a product of its time. Some things may have worked, and some may not have, but there was a drive behind everything, pushing the games to be the best they could be for you. I really wish they would have made a part four. removed from the release of the first game, and this ideology clearly stands at Monolith, who developed Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor, receiver of many awards, including Game of the Year from various reviewers and websites. The ideology also stands true with Craig Hubbard, who, with most of his team that worked on Shogo, Nolf, and Fear, left Monolith and started his own studio named Black Powder Games. Their first game, Betrayer, was released in 2014 and holds very positive reviews on Steam and a strong recommendation from myself. To answer my own question, if Fear didn't exist, we would have missed out on something great. 
shooting up baddies in slow motion yeah. my and child being scared literally. shitless is my idea of a great time. And without this franchise mixing those elements and many others together, I may never have had this experience. So thank you, Fear. And thank you for watching this video. I never, I'm not really good at PC game. I was trying to play. I was, wasn't that good. I need to get, I need to get like good at the controls. That was a good video. You did a good job on that. That was good, I like that. 